This is Tanya Lin with the Sistership Circle podcast. From spirituality, sexuality, and sisterhood to business, relationships, contribution, and creativity, the Sistership Circle podcast introduces a new model of feminine leadership where women get real and vulnerable about it all. Tune in for authentic advice that will empower you to be bold, beautiful, and brilliant as your true self. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Sister Ship the Podcast. It's Tanya Lynn here, and I am so excited to be tuning in with our sister, Erin Alta, and her dog. What's your dog's name? Honey. Honey. So Honey's joining us as well. We'll be hearing, <laughs> hearing from our pup in the background. So before we dive into this conversation, I just want to say that uh, I had heard of La Erin just in the interwebs on Facebook and um, and I went to her website and I was like, oh my God, I would love to interview this woman. I don't know why. And so I actually reached out to her and we had something set up and then she was like, you know what? I'm going on hiatus. <laughs> I'll get back to you when I'm ready for an interview. And so I was like, all right, cool. <laughs> totally respect that, taking care of ourselves. And I'm sure that we'll find out more about that. Um, and then she reached out and here we are. And I am so thrilled that she uh, has decided to come and have this conversation. And we have no idea where it's going to go, but that is always the best when we just trust the unfolding of the process, which has been a major theme in my life recently. Uh, I just got back from Avalon, a uh, trip to Glastonbury in the UK. And that was the whole theme was just trust the revealing of the process and why I had no idea why I was going on this retreat. And it was like each day just revealed itself of why I was there. And so I'm really in that flow. And um, when we got on the phone before this, we she's also like all right i'm just open to where this is gonna go and so we're all going on a journey together and we're gonna start with me sharing a little bit about this amazing woman who has been called a hand of the goddess creator of the sovereignty sanctuary a monthly gathering where women embrace their inner wisdom and truth through community connection and play her flagship course school of the sovereign women helps women use their voices, own their power, and make a powerful impact on the planet. Her in-person retreats, workshops, and one-on-one -on -one intensives have been called transformational temples for soulful, powerful women. And now you probably know why I wanted to connect with her. She's been speaking since 1991. She's spoken at Microsoft, colleges, Brave Girls Symposium, and other notable schools and organizations. Um, she's a certified forest yoga teacher, birth doula, Reiki master, and trained in the art of nonviolent communication. She's a student of Clarissa Pinkola Essays, who's the author of Women Who Run With the Wolves, and the late Sobufu Some, who I do not know. I would love to learn more about that amazing person. And she also has a daily two-hour Vipassana meditation practice as taught by Mr. Essen Goenka of Myanmar. And I've done many Vipassana retreats as well. So I love that common connection. And um, she's a speaker, scribe, mentor, and guide. Everything she does is about living in service of your soul and love, always love. So welcome, Erin. I'm so excited that we are here having our completely mysterious conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Mm, I'd love to have a start by you sharing your story and who you are. I mean, I can read a bio, but I think it's always better when someone tells us their story and their journey um, from their own words. Sure. Anywhere you would like me to start on my journey? Whatever is wanting to share itself and be revealed and, and feels really relevant um, to where you're at right now. You know, it's interesting. So as I said before we started recording, I live in Mexico. I'm in Mexico right now. It's a tiny little village, less than 2,000 people right on uh, the ocean. And 
what's interesting is a theme that keeps coming up when people, you know, I don't know how active you are on the Instagrams, but there's this new feature that's ask me anything and you can pose a question. And the, so I like to do this because I love when people ask me questions. And one of the questions that people keep asking me is, have you been like this your whole life? How did you get like this? Have you always been uh, free spirited? Have you always been an adventurer? Have you always um, done kind of things your own way? And the truth is, yes. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, some, someone asked me, how do you get over your fear? And people have asked me that a lot. I've been to 20, I think 26 or 27 countries at this point. Um, most of them by myself. I travel a lot. Um, and I don't have a lot of fear. I never have. I wasn't a fearful child. I'm not a fearful adult. So I think um, the best place that I can start is just by naming that when people, I think, want to know, because I, I love knowing how people got to be who they are and how they are. I love those kinds of um, questions and like just like listening to people's stories. And, and I think for me, the truth is like I've always followed my truth. I've always listen to myself, even when um, it's going against the grain, even when it was unpopular. I wrote this Facebook post yesterday about ha hating college. And I come from a long line of scholars, a long line of academians, academicians, however you say that, that word. You know, my, I'm fourth generation college graduate. My great grandparents both had undergraduate and graduate degrees. Um, right after U.S. Uh, enslavement ended, they both went to college and both got master's degrees. So that was like liberation, very literally for my family, was through school, through education, through knowledge um, in an academic sense. And, and I went to school and I always had gone to private schools and was very um, academically nourished and stimulated. And I went to college and I hated it. And I, I didn't hate my school. I didn't hate my fellow students. I didn't hate my teachers. I didn't want to be in a classroom. You know, I wanted to be in the world exploring. And I, after my first year, I told my mother, I'm going to, mom, I'm going to, I sat her down. I had a very serious conversation. I said, I'm going to take a year off from school and um, just go travel the world. And she said, what, is, what does that mean? We don't, we don't do that in this family. Those are her exact words. What does that mean? Wow we don't do that in this family. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, I was 18 or 19 at the time. I said, okay, well then I'll go back to school. And I went back and I was so depressed um, because I was so out of alignment. You know, some people have a very high tolerance for being out of alignment or they, they can numb and compartmentalize and rationalize themselves. And that's just not my path. If I'm out of alignment, my whole, everything is out of alignment. So I, after spending my second year of college depressed, I told my mom, I don't care what we do in this family. I'm taking a year off. And um, I went back to, I was living in Atlanta, I went to college in Atlanta, moved back to Seattle and worked at Nordstrom and sold makeup at the Mac counter and saved all my money and then went to Nepal and trekked in the Himalayas and went to India and Thailand and uh, France and the United Arab Emirates by myself. And so that for me is like the biggest kind of example of when I listened to someone else's path, I did what I was supposed to do and I was so unhappy. Um, and then I did what I wanted to do. And it's not like, you know, the depression just disappeared, but I was being honest. I was being truthful with myself and I could handle what was coming my way because it was my choice, not, following someone else's path. And then I've been kind of doing that in different ways ever since. <laughs> I can very much relate to your story. And I'm also an avid traveler and have been to like 25, 26 countries or something as well. And can just show up. I remember I went to India for six weeks, just showed up. I was like, okay, now what? <laughs> like, yeah. No plan. Had no plan. And it was just this incredible experience of, and by myself. So yeah, totally relate. And also, um, you know, truth is, I would say my main word as well, or, or my, mm. so I, yeah, I could just so feel that. And I'm wondering what led you to Mexico? 
Um, so, and, and this hiatus from the podcast, and it seems like maybe you've slowed down or something. So I'd love to hear what that alignment was about. Yeah, well, I slowed down by four. My whole life uh, imploded last year, uh, very surprisingly, very uh, much unanticipated. And my whole life just collapsed. And um, I couldn't, it, it sucked everything out of me. I had nothing left to give. I couldn't work in the ways that I had been working. I couldn't, because my work is all about holding sacred space and facilitating transformation and healing. And the, oh, I had no capacity to hold space for anyone. I, I couldn't um, function, you know? So I um, just came to Mexico. I was living in Seattle, which for those of you watching this who do not know, Seattle is very cold and very wet and very dark most of the year, especially in the winter which was not very loving and supportive of my well-being. So I came, uh, I initially, when, when everything kind of happened, I went to a friend of mine and said, I'm just going to send you to LA for three days. You need to get out of Seattle. And then I ended up staying for a month. And then I came back to Seattle for one night. And then I went with my mom to Mexico for two weeks. We came back to Seattle for um, a month. And then I came back to Mexico and I've been here I think four or five months ever since. So that's how I got here because I knew I needed to be someplace that would be warm, that would be near the ocean, that would be very, very quiet, very simple, tiny. I live in a village that has like one, it's not even a street, it's just like a road. <laughs> there's no stoplights, there's no, there's nothing really, I mean, there's restaurants and, you know, like, they drive around in the truck, the farmers selling the fruits and vegetables. So it's very low key. And that's exactly what I needed. I needed to, I knew that I needed to be someplace to heal and to recover and restore that would be environmentally supportive um, and not overstimulating. And so this has been that and the ocean and doing ritual at the ocean and really connecting with the ocean as a healer has been um, really good medicine for me. So um, and I've gone, I've left, I went to Louisiana to lead a meditation circle. I came back, I went to Texas to do a photo shoot. I came back, I just went to Seattle to get my dog and I came back. So I don't know how long I'll be here. Apparently this is the hot season. So I don't know how long I'll be here, but I am not, um, I'm not looking to leave anytime soon. I'm happy right, right here. Mm hmm Oh, you know, I think you just brought up a really important thing for us to dive into because so many of the women who are listening to this are either leading circles or are wanting to lead circles since that's what we do at Sistership Circle. And, um, you know, you brought up this important, important piece around having the capacity to be able to hold that sacred transformational space. Yeah. So you had to come back into alignment to then be able to, to do your work. Um, and, you know, that's, that's really, I feel like such an important piece for us to even talk about um, is how do you be that energy holder? How do you make sure that you are up for that? Um, and also, you know, the deeper the transformational space, the deeper that we need to go mm -hmm. within ourselves, right? Um, and I'm curious first, what had you start leading circles and, and mm -hmm. leading ceremony and ritual? What was that catalyst that got you started on this path? Yeah, so I've been doing, I've been holding space and doing women's circles for almost 20 years now. Um, after I came back from that first year I took off from, from college, I went back to Atlanta, back to school, and I was just kind of figuring out my way. So this was the late 90s and uh, spoken word poetry was a very big scene. And I would go to all these open mics and spoken word poetry readings and women would get on the mic and just say stupid poems, just like stupid, not bad, writ poorly written poems, not bad poems, just stupid poems that were just about trying to get a date. You know, like 
he licked my earlobe and I melted. And, you know, just like all these like poems got, they were really just trying to get, go home with someone that night. And I was like, I know these women have more to say than these like repetitive, you superficial, I know they're more brilliant than that. I know they're more interesting and creative than just like trying to be sexy on the microphone. So I was like, I'm just gonna start an all women open mic, all women only on the mic, all women only in the room. So we can hear the truth of like what's actually happening in your life. Um, and so I started this uh, open mic called Sister Fire. And what ended up happening was the first time, the first gathering, was at the Women's Center at Spelman, is where I went to school. So it's all, and what's interesting is I went to an all women's college, but yeah. this was the only all women's space on campus. Everything else was co ed. This was the only place I was like, no, this is only for women. And it's just so people, the first gathering, women got on the mic and said some poems and read some songs. And yeah, so it's like, this is good. This is interesting. Okay, I'm, this is what I'm here for. And then a woman I'll never forget because I periodically send her a Facebook message just to thank her because without her, I would not be doing the work I'm doing today. Mm -hmm. um, she got on the mic and said, I don't have a poem. I don't have a song. I don't have anything that I've written, but I have herpes and I don't have anywhere else to talk about it. And in that moment, I get chills now thinking yeah. about it. In that moment, the room changed. It was like in the movie, like you could just see the walls switched because what she did she gave everyone present permission to tell the truth yes. she gave everyone present permission to stop being cute and stop trying to you know be artsy fartsy but to really be truthful about what was happening not perfect not polished not all the way put together and it, the, she broke the ice and you could see women relax women sit up women listen women pay attention and people, women move to support her and to listen to her and to hold her hand. And she gave, every, she never came back and Sister Fire continued for years. I, I know her personally, so um, we've stayed in touch, but she never came back. She just needed that space to tell this truth and launch me in my work. So what happened ended up being that because she gave this permission, then women ended up talking about coming out on the mic being raped, sexually assaulted, abor abortions, uh, falling in love, falling out of love. You know, it became this transformational healing space. And I had to learn how to hold the container. I had to learn by hook and by crook and by fire how to create this container. And women said, this is why I came to Spelman. This is why I came to school. This is why I didn't drop out because of Sister Fire. This is why I didn't take my life because I knew Sister Fire was happening and I knew I would get what I needed here. You, so it became this powerful sisterhood, this powerful community where women, it, I, I mean, the women who came through Sister Fire, and, and it happened for years up, up until recently, like, so it's continued for, you know, 10, 15 years, maybe more than 15, but um, the, some women came to every Sister Fire and didn't talk at all, but they were there every third Thursday. Some women came and talked every time. It was, it was just about being witnessed, being a witness, being... Um, able to really hold the space and to be free. Um, and what the blessing and the gift was that it was a collective. So everyone brought their gifts. There was a woman who's Nicole, um, who would create what we call the womb. So she created this ornate, multifaceted, multi-layered art installation every sister fire that was her job and she chose it because she was an art major she's an art teacher now she's an artist she's a visual artist she's amazing and that was like her contribution people brought different things for the altars people brought, i mean it was like this and i my job was to hold that space and really learn how to feel energy and learn how to read the room and learn so it was because after that first time i went home and i was so irritated because i was like i did not start group therapy i just wanted poems <laughs> and then after that i went to school the next day and women were like so when's the next sister fire we're doing this again right this is and i was like okay message i got it you this is not this is bigger than me 
it's beyond me, it has nothing to do with me, I am a vessel. And so that's always my prayer is to be used as a vessel and not be in my ego about it because it has nothing to do with me. I'm just the arms of God. I'm just, you know, asking the divine source to come through me so that women can get the healing that they need it. So that's how I started. And then over the years, I've gotten all kinds of different trainings and facilitator trainings and, you know, like getting my skills, my tangible technical skills up, but really it came because this is the work I was born to do. And, and I got put in that environment to do it. Mm. Oh my God. That is such an amazing story. And I just want to unpack some of these pieces here around it because so many women who come through our trainings are so afraid to get started. And I think you really demonstrated an important piece around that you don't necessarily need to be perfect. You don't need to be this trained facilitator necessarily to get started. Yeah. And most of the time it's just follow that impulse, follow your heart. This, this is wanting to come through. It's from that own desire that you had. And then, then you get the training, right? Mm -hmm. and it's been the same with me. I kind of started because I just, I moved back to San Diego from New York City, didn't really have community, wanted community. Okay, I'm gonna start putting on these events. I have no idea what I'm doing. Over time, continuing to get educated and learning how to be the space holder, such a similar story. Um, and, and then learning how to do it as I go. And I think that that's such an important piece. You don't have to have it all figured out to get started. Yeah. And that vulnerability piece is what circle's all about. It's just about creating this safe space for us to share that thing that we don't have space to share anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Oh, so amazing. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. Thank you. So and, and I think what's important too about what you're saying, especially is when you think you have to have it all together and you have to be like this expert, you lose the vulnerability, you lose the humanity because you can't, it can't be all about you, right? Like it's not the whatever show. When I left, when I graduated, I had four women kind of fill in the space for me. They both, all four would, were running Sister Fire at the same time because they all had different skills and strengths that they brought to the table. So for me, it was like, I didn't need uh, other facilitators because we created it together. So we were all in the space together doing our different, it was a very collaborative environment. But when we all graduated, there needed to be some, a multiple people in leadership who could hold the dynamic. If I had chosen just one of those four, it would have been lopsided. So I think part of holding sacred space is like humility because it's not about you. Once you know it's not about you, then you can risk perfection. You know, then it's like, okay, I'm gonna do the best I can and, and invite other people to do their best too. Yeah. And sisters, I also want to point out that notice that La Erin, it wasn't about her period. I mean, it was about the women just getting up there on this mic and sharing. Yeah. You weren't doing anything. You're just sitting back and holding the space. That is what circle leadership is all about. Mm -hmm. It's not about us, like that we need to be teaching something or have this elaborate ritual plan. None of that. It's just, here's the space. Here's the mic or the talking stick or however you want to say, let's just have everyone go around and share. It can literally be that simple. Yeah. So I love that you shared that piece um, about it's not about you. And then the other piece around, we call it co-creative leadership, where it's, it's about us not being the only one leading, but about, okay, who else? How can we, the wheel of co-creative leadership, we all have a, a skill or a talent. <laughs> And how do we utilize that with, and how do we really draw that out of each other and yeah. how do we feel like a contribution? So I love that you really demonstrated the power of coming together as a group and, and having everyone take a piece of accountability. Oh, incredible. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Amazing. Um, and now you are leading a 12 month program called devotion yeah which i saw and um was actually considering doing it and i was like i can barely keep up with my own <laughs> stuff and my two little small children um under three so 
uh, I might catch you on the next year of that. But um, what I, I just felt really drawn into, um, I don't know, it was just the energy that you're, you're holding. So I'd just love for you to share a little bit about what this, um, what this offering is all about in the world and perhaps some of the things that have been coming through. I sure. Seen it. Yeah. So devotion is a year long spiritual exploration of race, gender, feminism, and liberation for us all. And it's, it's the prime time to really dive into this. So my degrees in comparative women's studies. And so I've been studying gender, race, feminine, you know, all of this for a long time. My mother is also the principal of her own uh, consulting organization it has that she started when I was in elementary school and she's been teaching about diversity training and sexual harassment and intent versus it. So these are the conversations I was raised on. And as a black person in Seattle, I had to learn how to talk about race very young because I was often the only in my honors classes and my other uh, schools and, and programs. So um, I've been having these conversations for a very long time and I have formal and informal training on them. But what it was felt important to me to, it, I don't usually teach or talk about these, this structured of a, a curriculum. Really, usually my work is about help, helping women get deeper intimacy in their relationship with themselves. And like really, because I think the relationship with yourself is a reflection of how you deal with the world. So that's what most of my work has been up to this point. But I realized that I needed to start also teaching women how to use that relationship with themselves more proactively, more informed, more structurally as they deal with the world. Um, and so I have, there's women from all over the world, all races, nationalities, ethnicities, ages, sexual orientations, background. It's just like, it's like sister fire on, in the virtual space, which I love. Um, and so for me, it's about the same thing. How do I create a sacred container, a brave container to have hard conversations, to have challenging conversations? And the way that it's set up is each month has a different module. And so the first module, month one, is all about truth. We're not talking about race. We're not talking about gender. We're not talking about all of these external things, which, which they're internal too. But first, we have to understand our relationship to the truth. Because when we start getting into all of these other conversations, everyone's going to have a different interpretation of them. And we have to learn how to start looking at our own interpretation of the truth, understanding of the truth. Where do we get that information about the truth before we can go there. So truth is month one, and then spirit is month two. And once we have those kind of foundational building blocks, then we can start talking about race and gender and feminism and sovereignty and self-care and legacy and lineage, all these other things. But we have to do it from really being able to tell ourselves the truth first. So that's that's how it, it started. And it's it's really beautiful. One of the core agreements and, and values and principles of devotion is that, um, that's my dog being <laughs> vocal, is that everything that happens in devotion stays in devotion. Mm -hmm. There's, this is not a, a place where, um, and there's some wise, smart, interesting, creative, dynamic women in there. And so the first call, someone was like, well, well what if I want to, can I just reshare? Can I post this on Facebook? That person said that comment and it really struck me. And I had to say no, because while you, that person, and that person that she was actually asking about was like, no, please, that's like my signature thing. I want more people to know about this. But, but boundaries, for example, is one of our months. I think it's month seven. And there are some women who signed up exclusively or primarily to work on their boundaries right mm -hmm. and so if someone has come in and is like i just can i sh you just say something beautiful if they haven't done their boundary work they may just say yeah sure and not really mean it right so i i needed to honor everyone in the room not just the folks who felt comfortable and confident being reshared but those who may be saying i've been working on this in therapy for three years and i know it sounds insightful to you but it's still a really tender place for me but i haven't figured out how to say no yet I don't, I don't want them to have that responsibility. So everything that happens in devotion stays in devotion. And that, the, orig the origin of that at Sister Fire was what we called the four wall rule. Everything that happened in Sister Fire stayed in Sister Fire. Those four walls, everything that happened in that container. So 
for me, it's about how do I, and it took me years really to figure this out, years, how to create a sacred space virtually because I was so used to doing it in person, so gifted at doing it in person that when I tried to figure out how to do it online, it felt cumbersome and clunky and, and not um, sacred. You know, sometimes the technology doesn't always feel sacred to me. So um, I feel like I've gotten a good rhythm now about how do we hold this container so that people start to trust each other and tell the truth and that those who feel a little bit more shy um, also feel comfortable saying, I don't, I don't know anything about this. I, I'm bumping my head and I need a safe place to work through all of this. So that's really what devotion is. And my job, again, is to hold the container, ask really good questions, give a really good kind of structure to go through the process. But ultimately, it's still about each participant's relationship with themselves and they're in the world. I, there's a, before anyone can access the master classes or the Q&A calls, they have to fill out this very long and extensive intake form that's called the golden ticket. And it goes through each month. So it goes through um, truth, spirit, race, gender, and feminism, and asks questions about their own current relationship to all of those categories so that I know who's in the room. Because part of what it is, is, you know, I have people, I have, there's a woman in devotion who is a PhD in education, who teaches teachers, who is a social justice activist right now. Like she's been doing this for years. And then I have women in the in devotion who've never talked about race before in their lives, right? Who've, who are like, this is a brand new conversation. I can't create a curriculum that's like this water fire hose curriculum that both of them are gonna get something from unless I know what they're bringing into the conversation. So, so that's, that's the golden ticket. And it's been invaluable to really, because it's devotion, right? Like, it's not like a dip in and dip out. You have, it's like, you want, if, yeah, if you want to be in this, this is about commitment to like really be in these conversations. So when people turn in their golden ticket, it's a sign that they're ready for this, this journey and that it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, there's no bar to meet, but that it, they have to be willing to, to show up. So much good stuff that you just shared. Oh my God. Um, I'm like, how do we even begin to unpack this? Because there's so many teachable moments for women who are leading. I mean, and this is so great, but I think where I want to just dive in here is the concept of the brave circle. And this mm -hmm. has been something since I've learned that term, um, have really talked about, you know, that this is not necessarily a safe circle. Right. Because playing, that means we're playing it safe, which means we're playing small when we shift our context to a brave circle. And so I think that you just distinguished one of the things that helps to create a brave circle, which is that boundary of the confidentiality. I love that. Um, something that actually I haven't, cons I love, I just learned something there. Um, so I just really want to acknowledge that piece of, I just learned something from you there. And what else, um, if you can give us like one or two other things that really help you to create a brave circle, what would they be? Well, my, I don't, I mean, I don't like having a lot of rules. I have, you know, like, I like having really clear ones, like everything that happens here stays here. Uh, respect the mic, which means when one person's talking, the other person's talking and no apologies. Those are basically my three ground rules. Everything else is fair game. Because it needs to be like you able to, oh, well, the biggest one is that we take responsibility for our own experience. Yeah. You're not, and no caretaking, no rescuing, no fixing anybody else. You're here for yourself. So, for example, in the first call, uh, two women were like, I want, call me out, call me out. I need to be called out, call me out. And I, and you know, if I say something offensive, call me out because they don't want to go into the world and then say or do something offensive. And while we live in a very call out, call in culture right now, devotion is about building your own muscles of self-awareness and self-accountability. So that when those, you go out into the world and someone calls you out, that you have, it doesn't shock your system because you're already self-aware enough to be like, I get that your truth is not my truth. This is why we start with truth, right? To distinguish that 
what truth is not universal. Truth is there's not this um, one truth. So that when, so, th so that, because I think call out and call in culture often atrophies our muscles of self-awareness because we're like, well, someone's gonna call me out if I do something wrong. And that's, I'm interested in helping nurture and support leaders who are self-accountable and, and flexible at the same time. So, so that's the biggest one, which requires also not rescuing anybody. Let people fumble around. Let people uh, not quite know the right words to say. It's a, this is a container. This is not, you know, out there where you might make a mistake and, and it could cost you money or your reputation or something else. This is why this is, this is why everything that happens in devotion stays in devotion because um, you need a place to be messy and, and, yeah. and, it's no other participant's job to let that be true. That's my job. So be messy. There's no judgment. And then let's work through this. Let's like, let it be uncomfortable because there's a difference between being, feeling safe and feeling comfortable. If you're, you can be uncomfortable and safe at the same time. And yeah. that's what I'm always encouraging. Let's push a little, let's be uncomfortable and, and have hard conversations because those were the breakthroughs happen. Yes. Yes. So getting rid of the rules in a way, everything being fair game, let's continue to push that edge mm -hmm. of where your, your comfort zone is. And that's, what's going to create the brave circle. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so because powerful. it's also like, you know, something that I have to, because it's so counter to how we normally think about things when people, you know, so, so they're the way that the, the course is structured is that there's one masterclass a month and then you have some experiments and assignments to go see how that lives in your own daily life. To, and the first month is just about observing yourself. Like, what are you noticing about yourself? Not the, there's nothing to do, just like observe. And then we have Q and A call um, in, on the third Thursday of the month. And so part of what it is, is like, when we get to truth, people are often like, how could they do that with their truth? How is that, how is that when it's like, let's, not make it about anybody else. Again, turn back to yourself. What are you assuming about their truths? What are you assuming about yourself? Like if we start turning into this process of self-awareness and self-inquiry, then we're aware of our own biases and prejudices. So by the time we get to race and gender and all of these other things, we can say, oh, I get that. I get that I have a bias around that. I get because that's the truth that I've been living with or, to, you know, as opposed to like, I don't have a bias. I don't see race. I'm nothing. No, no, no. Which is not true. We all see race. I want people to see my race. They would feel very uh, dishonest not to see my race. So instead of like denying, what do you see? Right? Like, let's go deeper into what's true instead of denying it because you don't want to be good. You don't want to be bad. Yes. This is so good. <laughs> I love this approach. You know, there's this just feels like such a huge topic right now. And so many teachers coming out, you know, and, and teaching about race and, and a lot of the calling out going on online. And I love this approach of let's start with truth. Let's start from developing this level of self-awareness so that we can, from that place, then have the conversation. Yes. And each person is coming with this awareness and a mindfulness to the conversation. And that just feels so much more inviting mm -hmm. than a lot of what's, um, I think, going on out there. So thank you. Thank you for bringing this forward. I'm so, I'm just really honoring you. In what thank you're, you. What you're thank bringing you. To the conversation. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay. So I'm um, wanting us to kind of start wrapping up here. Um, I... You just, you, I, I feel like women who, who are leading circles or wanting to lead circles, there are so many gems here um, for you to get, you know, in terms of holding space, this permission piece that you've brought forward, the messiness piece. Um, you know, I just, I, I feel like there's so many really, really important distinctions that you've brought that women can really learn from. Um, so in, in kind of wrapping up here, um, it, since it's not open right now, is there a wait list for devotion and people can find that and learn more if they're wanting to jump into the next round? Let's give that link and we'll drop it into our show notes as well. 
Yeah, it's Laren Alta. Laren is my first name, L-E-R-I-N, Alta, A-L-T-A, um, dot com, backslash or forward slash, slash, <laughs> wow. devotion. Yeah. And then you can go there and find out all the topics that we cover. And then there's a wait list if you, if you add your name there, which is great. And what's, what I've done for the wait list is when you join the wait list, you get a question that's just like, what do you want to get out of devotion? And I've been getting really interesting answers, which helps me again, shape the curriculum for the people who are coming. And I'm going to run it again in December. Um, it'll, the doors will open again in December because we have, 8 billion people on the planet we're going to create. And that's for me, it's race, gender, feminism, and liberation for us all, right? If we're going to liberation for us all, we got to get really clear about what that means, who is, why we're not all liberated now, how one of my healers work with um, says, you know, to get free, you have to know where you're bound. And it's it's so true so we have to really look at where are what's binding how do we get free which is not the same answer for everybody which again is why we're the truth mm. yeah yeah that's a really powerful mission and it's it's true i mean i yeah this is just amazing that you're doing this and um <laughs> it's about all of us you know, yeah. if, if just some of us are doing the work, it's, it's really about no sister left behind is a motto that we have here at Sistership Circle. And that's mm -hmm. what I really hear that you're devoted to is no sister left behind. And that you are really, um, through your golden ticket, through this question, when people get on the wait list of really serving all women yeah. and not leaving anyone behind. So, ah, oh, so beautiful. Um, if you had a microphone to all the women what would you want to yell from the rooftops? My mantra, my philosophy is breathe and trust your truth. That's as simple as it gets. And I think it's really important for women when you're leading circle, again, going back to that humility, one of the ways that I organically learned how to hold space when, when people, when women, especially when I was starting, I mean, I do it still now, would share hard things is like, I had to keep breathing because that keeps the energy moving, that keeps everything moving. And sometimes we would pause and say, okay, everyone take a deep breath. Everyone breathe together. Everyone, she just shared, shared some really hard shit. Everyone, let's breathe and move that. Not dismiss it, not ignore it, but like acknowledge it, create this space for it. There's no need to rush through it. So when you start breathing, and trusting yourself, honey. When you start breathing and trusting yourself, you'll be able to recognize when your body feels something. And on it often, what your body needs, the rest of the room needs too. So if you need to take a breath, the room probably needs to take a breath. If you need a water break or to stretch or a hug, the room probably needs that too. So it's I, I created the term facilitant, which is like a facilitator and a participant at the same time. So that you, it's not this wall between you and the group, but it's like, how do you share? Cause you're all sharing energy. You're all sharing this dynamic. So how do you, if you're the leader, how do you give them what they need that they might not even know they need until they take a breath or drink some water or stretch or get a hug from somebody? Which goes back to that self-awareness and the constantly checking in with yourself. What do I need? What am I feeling? What am I sensing? We teach so many of the same things. I love this. I just love, I feel like you're just like totally affirming so much of what I teach around. And I love that word. Uh, because yeah. I'm always talking about that. Like when I'm in circus, I'm participating just as much as I need. Otherwise, yeah. I mean, what am I really doing, you know, and, and I can actually then receive and give and I'm in the flow and then I'm opening the flow for everyone. So brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That's, exactly, that's exactly it. Uh huh. And I would say probably a lot of um, your self-awareness and body awareness and breath comes a lot from the Vipassana meditation and being so in tune with the body sensations. I mean, this was before Vipassana. This was, this was, yeah. 
You know, I think I came into these gifts partially um, naturally. I think I was born with them partially out of childhood trauma where I had to learn to be hyper aware of other people's energy and hyper aware of what else was happening in the room. Um, and so that kind of golden uh, chemistry of like what I, and gave me these superpowers and which is also why I had to take that break earlier this year because I was like, oh, I didn't, I was like, oh, my superpowers are attached to trauma. I need to like reevaluate this. So I think, but that's about the self-awareness too. It's like constantly being in humility. So it's like, I, I could afford to take the break, not because necessarily financially, but because I had to, but because I would be doing everybody a disservice if I showed up kind of like mangled energetically, shredded emotionally and tried to hold, that would be a disservice to everyone. So I had to do my own healing work and do what I teach in order to be able to really hold a strong container again. And set that boundary of like, I'm gonna, I need to turn inward. Yep. Setting the boundary. Yep. And I'm gonna go and um, take care of myself. That's it. So that I can then show up in, in greater service because you're already of massive service and just it's you just up leveling to your next level of devotion and bringing that out into the world. So of course, thank you. Thank I get you. it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This thank has you. been such a wonderful little journey that we've gone on from childhood to college <laughs> to sister fire to Mexico. I mean, we've really been on this little voyage today. So I appreciate being on the, the journey with you today. Thank and you. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in. And you can learn more um, at um, the links, go to the show notes to learn more about devotion and catch us next time for the next Sistership Circle podcast. Thank you for having me.